It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And so here we are on our second last Sunday in Lent. Easter is only two weeks away. And you, don't, you wouldn't think it sneaks up on the pastor, but this week all of a sudden I was like, oh, I probably should get bulletins to the um, secretary to get done for Holy Week. And so it is here, it's upon us. And we, I'm hoping we're ready for it. We do have a sunrise service on Easter morning. It's um, at 6.15 at, well, right now it's at Mossy Bank. We're going to trust that the village gives us the okay tomorrow. And so if it's not there, we'll be out front here if we have to be. We will have a sunrise service, though. This week in our the life of our church, we have um, finance committee at 5 or 5.30 on Tuesday. I'll be here at 5. We can chat if it's at 5.30. Um, Tuesday night, and then on Wednesday, we have Bible study at 10 o'clock, and then we have church council at 5.30. And so we ask everybody who is a committee chair to um, get your reports in to um, the council, to Wood Sprague, um, or to the office. Um, by Monday or Tuesday so that we can send them out and that way whenever there's business, there's some business that we have to take care of that we can have time to discuss. We're not just hearing reports, but it's a working committee that is uh, getting things done for the church and moving us forward. So if you're a chair of a committee, please get a report in. Um, we also have Thursday at 1 o'clock grief support. Is there anything else in the life of the church that, Mr. Dunham? Uh, I think you probably realize that if you walk in this one for collecting toilet paper for a certain point, and we would appreciate it if you could bring in as much as possible. Toilet paper for turning points. So. And the extra toilet paper. <laughs> It's, that's one of those things that last a couple of years ago, man, that was, we were all a little bit uh, worried about toilet paper. Anyone else? All right. Let us still our hearts, take a deep breath in. All of the concerns and cares and worries and Decisions that have been weighing down on us this week, let us let go. We have come to worship God, who is bigger than all of those problems, who loves us beyond words. I invite you to be called to worship in our responsive reading. Slowly we come to worship on this holy day. Reluctantly, we hear the story of Jesus' suffering. Bleakly, we follow Jesus to the cross. Humbly, we acknowledge our part in his passion. Deeply, we yearn to understand the depth of this sacrifice. Solemnly, we gather this day to pray and worship together, giving thanks for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us take a posture of worship as we sing, O Sacred Head Now Wounded.
scripture lesson is a hard one, this one. As our call to worship said, we are called to remember the difficulties, not just the joys. Then Pilate took, G excuse me, it's from John chapter 19, 1 to 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he claimed to be the king, the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I am power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the empire, emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified.
I invite you to pray for me as I pray for you. Here we are, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We have been journeying through John, John 18 and 19, for the last four weeks. We've been journeying through John, the gospel, since the beginning of the year, as we've been following the narrative lectionary. And so we have been, for four weeks, at the trial and now the crucifixion of Jesus. And as we are going through the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus, one of the things we're invited to do is to see the contrast. I talked about how I hate watching myself on video, I hate hearing my voice on recording, that there is this call for us, though, to sit in that uncomfortable place. My sermons are better when I actually do see those little nuances that I do. I hear the rep repetitive words that I might use as filler space. I see myself playing with my rings. I can stop that. I can work on how I deliver my sermons. I can be better and hone that skill when I listen to the recordings and I watch the video and I see those little things that annoy me. And so it's helpful. Lent is a time of self-reflection. And as we've gone through the story, it's a lot of uncomfortableness because, well, when we're contrasting Jesus and what Jesus is doing and how Peter and how the Jewish leadership, our scriptures said the Jews a lot. It's not the Jews because a lot of the Jews were supporters of Jesus. And even the Jewish leaders, they weren't awful people. They were trying to protect themselves. According to John chapter 11, we find that the Jewish leaders are afraid that Rome's going to come down because another Messiah has been declared to be amongst them. And Rome doesn't like someone that raises themselves up as king. They don't want the Jewish people to rally around someone. They come down hard. And so the Jewish leadership has every reason to have some fear, because Rome is ruthless. But as we're seeing this contrast between the human response of Peter, you know, of the Jewish leadership, and then of the crowd who cries, give me Barabbas, we are contrasting that with Jesus, who, as the song, The Bells Just Played, never said a mumbling word. We have him before Pilate, not saying a word there. Saying, you say that I'm king. You're the one declaring this. I, oh, Jesus gives every opportunity for the people of God, the Jewish leaders, to remember that the values that they hold is to do justice and to love mercy. Gives Pilate every opportunity to do justice, even though he doesn't care about doing justice. And ultimately, Jesus shows the unconditional, all-powerful love of God as he doesn't strike back. He doesn't take up violence. He doesn't return the accusations and fall into that. He gives his life for us. We have Peter that began the trial story denying Jesus. Peter who promised that he would die with Jesus. And in fact, Peter is the one in the garden when Judas betrays Jesus. He's willing to kill 
for Jesus. He doesn't do a good job. He only lops off somebody's ear. He's not a good swordsman, but he does violence. He is willing to take someone's life for Jesus. But he's not willing to die. In fear, he says, I don't know that man. Even as they recognize him, I don't know him. You sound like a Galilean. You've got that accent. No, it's not me. I'm not one of his disciples. You have the Jewish leaders who, they know their values to do justice, to love mercy. But out of fear, they are willing to become partners with someone who doesn't even hold those values, that doesn't know justice and doesn't care about mercy. They are able to compromise for the sake of their own security and the security of their people. And today we hear the words we have no king but the emperor. Pilate is standing there saying, okay, the charge is, because if the Jewish leaders bring the charge that he's making himself, himself equal to God, Pilate doesn't care. And so they said, well, you're not a friend of the emperor. If you're going to let somebody who is considered to be our messiah not go punished. He's going punished. He's he's not he, he's dangerous and he's a threat to the emperor. You're not a friend to Caesar if you're gonna let a messiah run loose. And so Pilate says, okay, we're, that's the charge he's going to be crucified on as the king of the Jews. And then the Jewish leaders want to make sure that Pilate knows. They're not on Jesus' side. He's not our king. You're not crucifying our king. We have no king but Caesar. This echoes back to the Hebrew scriptures. Do you remember when we went through the story? It seems like yesterday, but it was three years ago. And we were going through the story, and Israel gets delivered out of Egypt, you know, if you saw the Prince of Egypt story or the Ten Commandments, and they come through the Red Sea, they wander for 40 years in the wilderness, and then in Joshua they get the land. They conquer the Holy Land, and they go and reside in this land that God promised to Abraham. And then after that, Joshua, we get the book of Judges. And we have where the 12 tribes are kind of loosely together. If they don't want to send their soldiers to protect another tribe, they don't have to. They just, they're kind of there. And they're doing whatever's right in their own eyes. And so an enemy comes and attacks. And then a judge is raised up and leads them to victory. And then when that judge dies, they go through that cycle again 12 times doing what's right in their own eyes, enemies attack, God rescues them to a judge, and they just keep on going through that in Judges. It's that cycle. And at the end of Judges, it looks hopeless. We get Samuel born. He is that go-between the Judges era and the King's era. He's a prophet. He's, he is raised up with the priest of Eli, and when he gets old, the people go, we want a king. All of our problems are going to be solved if we just had a king. Give me a king. And God says to Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So we have that echo here. The people are like, give us a king. We want a strong man like all of the other nations to rule over us, to unite us. This is 
going to solve all of our problems. If we just have that right person in power, we're going to, it's going to go well. And we know the story. Saul fails. David, God raises up David. David does well, but he starts to falter. And his son divides the kingdom after he taxes them and his sons take over. And it's, it's this chaos again because people are looking for security in the ways of the world. All the other nations had kings and it's going well for them. Instead of trusting God. We get there again on the day of Christ's crucifixion as the people say, we have no king but Caesar. They wholeheartedly abandon the values of their faith to save the temple, to save the rituals, to save those things that they call sacred, they give up their values, do justice. They're going to crucify, they're asking the state to crucify an innocent man. Love mercy. What is merciful about crucifixion? What is merciful about crucifying an innocent man? They give up that which the Lord requires of them for security. And I have to ask, how often do I give up? You know, compromise my values here and there. How many times do I think that all we need for healing to come to the land, healing to come to our nation, if we get the right person in office? And you know something, folks? That's not how salvation comes. We have no king but Jesus. And therefore... I have to speak truth to Democrats and to Republicans. I have to stand for the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is not going to be brought in the White House. That the kingdom of God is, is not going to come through Wall Street. The kingdom of God, blessed are the meek. Tell me. Where in our society is someone who's weak? Humble. Oh, we don't. We don't go around people who are humble. That's nice. That's them over there. But, you know, we raise up leaders who are confident and strong. I said, are the meek, the humble. The kingdom of God comes through meekness. Humility is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Our society tells us to move on as quick as possible. Get over it. Pull yourselves up by the, your bootstraps. Blessed are the peacemakers. Our society rejoices at people who are able to put people in place, to tell it like it is, even if it's mean and nasty. We don't have kindness as the value in our culture. Kindness and meekness, that's all considered weak. But in the kingdom of God, that is how God's kingdom comes. We cannot bring peace through violence. We have to walk the path of peace. So church, we have to have a different flavor. We have to stand and proclaim we 
have no king but Jesus. And the way healing comes through to the land is not through Washington, D.C., not through Hollywood, not through all of those cultures. It's not in the culture wars. It is in you and I being that taste of heaven. Meekness, kindness, that love that turns the other cheek. And you know something? I wish he could come through Washington because it's a lot easier for me to vote than for me to love the person who is damaging me or hurting me or betraying me. It's a lot easier to vote in than it is for me to live out. God's kingdom is not of this world. And, and, and the good news is, even when we falter and we say, I have no king but Caesar, when I compromise, when I say, give me Barabbas just this once, because I'm tired and forgiving and loving and being humble and being kind is hard right now. You know something, Jesus is still Offering grace and love. That's the, the message of Holy Week. That there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God because God's love is going to prevail. Even when we are turning our backs, when we are faltering, when we are misstepping, even when we get it wrong, God's love and God's grace still extends. So come home. You're not coming home to judgment. You're not coming home to a lecture. You're coming home to grace and love. It is the father in the prodigal son running to you to offer grace, to bring you home, to throw a party. You're home. I thought you were dead, but you're alive. You're home. And then the call is for us to turn around and offer that to our family, to our friends, to those around us, that love and that grace. Get up and do it again. Get up and try again. Because you know something? We're not on our own. The Spirit of God is with us. Love wins. 1 Corinthians 13 says it all. We can have the standards. The, the Pharisees, they had the standards. The, they knew the scriptures. Peter, Peter looked like he was one of the disciples. They recognized him. They, he sounded like them. And they still faltered. But 1 Corinthians 13 says we can have it all right and have the right beliefs and not have love and we're claiming symbol. But man, when God's love is involved, that is patient, kind, not boasting, not rude, that celebrates justice and righteousness, that love that never fails, that love will always remain. At the end of 1 Corinthians 13, it says love remains. The greatest of these is hope, faith, and love. And love is love is the one that remains. When we take 1 Corinthians 13 and we let love produce patience and kindness, when we decide that we're not going to work by the means of this world, the kingdom of God quietly starts to seep in and starts to change things. Church, let us believe the words of Jesus. Let us really trust that and let us proclaim as we journey, we're at the cross on this Sunday. Next week we, we crucify and Jesus dies and 
going to be Passion Sunday as well as Palm Sunday. But as we do that, let us embrace that love, knowing God has loved us that deeply to go to the cross, to suffer such a death for us so that we can rise to new life and freedom in Christ. We don't have to live in the fear. We don't have to let fear control us and drive us to the point that we give up our values, to the point that we give up who we are. We are on the side of love, and love wins. Jesus has won the victory. Come home, we've all failed. Come home to the loving arms of the Father. Let us go out from this place in the strength and the grace of God to not trust the ways of this world, but to live out that radical love of Christ. Amen. In your bulletins and on the screen is our Lenten Creed. Let us say that together. We believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God, who knows our names and recognizes our deepest needs. We believe that Christ is the Word made flesh, and that His grace is like living waters that can never be exhausted. We believe that Christ showed us how great God's love for us is through His birth, life, suffering, death, and resurrection. We believe in the birthing, renewing, and enabling Spirit of God who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. We believe that God is in the arid desert as well as in green pastures, and that hard times and disciplines are also loving gifts. We believe that our journey has a purpose and a destination, and that our path leads to a glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that in the church we are fellow pilgrims on the road, and that we are called to love one another as God loves us. We believe that as Christ washed the feet of the disciples, we are called to serve others. This is our faith, and we are humble to profess in Jesus the Christ. Amen. I um, invite the offer to come forward as we sing our doxology. If Emily would like to grab the offering. As we sing. You can stand.
as we come to the Lord in prayer, um, we remain praying for Marilyn Muzi, as well as Joyce Ryan. Joyce is still at her daughter's, um, recovering from her surgery. Do we have any other prayer requests? Sean. Uh, Dr. Frankie is uh, not doing too well. Dr. Frankie. Frankie? Chiropractor right here in back. Pray for Dr. Frankie too. Victoria and Gabby are sick this morning, fighting the fever. Victoria and Gabby. We pray for them. Ida? Oh, Jan Kroc is sick. Let's pray for her. Anyone else? Well, let us go to the Lord and pray. God of mercy, God of grace, we thank you that you are ever present, that you are still at work in our world. And so we pray for the healing, the wholeness, for Marilyn and Joyce, for Dr. Dr. Frankie and, and Victoria and Gabby and Jan. We also think of Penny. And we ask, oh God, that you be gracious and kind and merciful. Work with doctors and nurses. Be in each of their situations as they choose and make decisions. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring healing and wholeness. We pray for our world. We think of Ukraine. We think of all of the atrocities that are happening. And we are overwhelmed. And so we ask, oh God, in your mercy, that you would change the circumstances of our world. Move on those who are around Putin move in Putin's heart, change the direction that they are headed. We pray, Lord Jesus, that mercy and grace would win out. We pray that you give world leaders wisdom in the midst of these times. We pray for our president, our Congress, our governor, our mayor, and all of our representatives. And we ask that justice and peace would be in their hearts and in their minds that they would be moved for justice and peace. We pray for our church, for Centenary United Methodist Church as we reach out to our community with the food pantry as well as with our closet, that you would make a way for us to tell our story to the world and how much you love them, how much you are at work here at Centenary. We pray, Lord, that you be with our denomination, United Methodist Church, be with our bishops, our, our own bishop, Mark Webb, and our district superintendents, um, Jeff McDowell, and our incoming district superintendent, Sherry Rood. Provide for them, care for them, give them the wisdom and grace and mercy that they need. Help them to, to lead us well, to love you and to love our neighbor. We pray that you would direct our paths, that we would have the ears to hear, the eyes to see. Show us your spirit in each moment where we can offer you peace and grace. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we come to the table, I say it all the time, but this is not the table of the United Methodist Church. This is not the table of uh, my own. This is, this is the Lord's table. Here, Christ meets us. Here, Christ calls each of us, no matter where we've been, No matter what churches we've been part of, no matter 
if this is our first time and we are making a decision towards Christ, or this is our thousandth time, returning to this table here at this table, God celebrates with us. God offers grace to us. God meets us here wherever you are. The pain, the fears, you can lay them here at the table. And Christ's grace is offered. And so we come, knowing that we get to meet Christ. And then, in that love, we get to serve each other and serve God's world. Let us pray. Merciful God, you created us in love. And when our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You called to us through prophets. You called to us to come home, to remember that we belong to you. And so, in the right time, you sent Jesus into this world. The word made flesh to walk amongst us, to preach the good news to the poor, freedom to the captives, heal the blind and the lame. We remember on the night that Christ was betrayed, how he took the bread, he gave thanks to you. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on after the supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. So, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we now offer ourselves as living and holy sacrifices to you in union with Christ offered for us. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And pour out your Holy Spirit on the gifts of bread and cup. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until we come and sit at your heavenly table. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We were broken. Christ was whole. Christ has been broken so that we may be whole. We were in need of forgiveness, and Christ poured out all that he had for our forgiveness. Come, we will be coming to the table around the altar. I invite those who are serving. If you cannot come to the table, we do have somebody bringing the bread and um, cups to you. So we will be coming up around the table this morning. I invite those who are serving to come forward.
she's right at one station and uh, it doesn't work that way. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to invite those of you in this section to please come and fill up around the table. You'll receive the bread and you'll receive the cup. You can partake as you wish and stay as long as you want and then um, leave the table.
Let us pray. Here at this table, oh God, you have shared with us the great mystery that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that your grace is greater than any sin. You have welcomed us home. And now we pray that because we have feasted here with you, that you have offered yourself to us, that we will be filled with your Holy Spirit to go forward in your love and grace. Amen. Our closing hymn is my favorite. So I'm not sure I was told that this church doesn't know this hymn, but um, you're going to have to sing it with me. <laughs> Every year. So 
it's, it's a holy week hymn, so I only can really sing it once a year. So uh, if you uh, would like to take a posture of worship, it is on page 285 of your hymnal if you need um, the music to go along. But I invite you to take a posture of worship as we sing to mock your reign. Everything here. <laughs> 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 